I sat there motionless, almost paralyzed, as my wife of 25 years explained why she was handing me divorce papers. I only caught about half of what she said. Ryan, are you even listening? You look like you're in a daze. This is important, she said, snapping me out of my thoughts. I'm sorry, my mind wandered for a minute. What were you saying again? I asked. The terms are simple. There's nothing to contest. I'm asking for nothing. Do you understand? Absolutely nothing. You keep the house, the cars, and all the money in the bank. If you sign, it'll all be over in three months. I was at a loss for words. Amelia and I had been together since high school. We raised two beautiful twin daughters, Layla and Lily, both now studying international banking at Columbia. We had a nice suburban home, drove Toyotas, and Amelia had her own credit cards and cell phone. I never denied her anything. I never cheated, never verbally or physically abused her. She never indicated she was unhappy or complained about anything. There was no way I could have seen this coming. Maybe that was the problem. I hadn't been paying enough attention. I understand the logistics of the divorce, Amelia, but can you tell me why? I know it's probably too late for me to change anything, but I'd like to understand. Amelia slouched in the kitchen chair, clearly reluctant to delve into the reasons and hoping I'd simply sign the papers and let her go. Can you give me the condensed version, Amelia? What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, Ryan. You were a perfect husband. Sometimes I wished you'd mess up so I'd have a reason to leave, but you never did. You raised the kids wonderfully, got them into college. You always gave me everything I wanted, even when I was being unreasonable. You bought us a beautiful house. My parents adore you. You didn't do anything wrong. She looked amazing for 45. Her complexion was flawless, her hair perfect, a light brown with glistening highlights in the sunlight. She jogged regularly, maintaining a nicely toned and tanned body. She was the epitome of grace during the week, yet could effortlessly transform into glamour when needed. Amelia was as perfect as she claimed I was. I just couldn't fathom the reason behind her decision. I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense. There has to be a reason. You can't just say everything's fine and then leave. There has to be something. Ryan, I'm trying to spare your feelings and not make myself look bad. Can we just leave it at that? No. Ryan, I found someone else. He's a developer, owns a nice condo by the river, and drives a beautiful black Mercedes. He's good looking, wealthy, and deeply in love with me. You, on the other hand, have always been a produce clerk in a supermarket. I'm not belittling your job because you've always provided for us and ensured our family's comfort, but you'll always be seen as a produce clerk. I wanted more. I couldn't see you striving for more. You were always content with what you had, and I couldn't see you trying to improve. That stung. I was the manager of the produce department, yet she still saw me as just a clerk. When I had opportunities to advance or move elsewhere, I turned them down to keep our family together. And now this was my reward. It hurt, but it wasn't worth mentioning. Does this rich, good-looking guy have a name? Nathan Mitchell. He's the president of Keystone Development Company. How long have you known him? Six months. Have you slept with him? Amelia sat up straight in her chair, her eyes darting around before meeting mine. Yes, I was trying to avoid the subject, but since you insisted on bringing it up, yes. You were still married. Yes, I was. I cheated on you. I was unfaithful. I was a whore. Are you satisfied now? I sat for a moment, then reached over and grabbed the divorce papers. I signed three places, initialed two, and pushed them back across the table to her. I guess he's a better man than I was. Sorry for the disappointment. As I got up and began walking out of the room, Amelia cried out, No, damn it. That wasn't the reason. He wasn't better than you, just different. Don't you dare go away believing that, Ryan. Don't you dare. But by that time, I was already out the door. I had been so engrossed in my work and hobbies that I hadn't even noticed Amelia gradually moving her things out of the house. When she handed me the papers, most of her clothes and personal items had already found their way to Nathan's condo. She had left all the wedding pictures and family photographs for me to keep. When I returned to the house, she was gone. 
Her Toyota sat in the driveway, a silent reminder of her absence. She left a power of attorney to sell the house and her car on the kitchen table. I spent the rest of the night cleaning out the beer from the refrigerator. I figured it was a done deal by then. There was no going back, and honestly, I had no desire to. Amelia was gone, and she would stay gone. The next morning, I called into work and took three months of overdue vacation. They had always been nagging me to take time off, so I didn't have any problem. With plenty of vacation time and sick leave accrued, I made a quick call to the girls at school and briefly explained that we were splitting, but refused to give them any other information. They wanted to call Amelia, but I didn't have her new phone number. I had three months to get myself together and decide what I was going to do. I had the landline phone disconnected and changed my cell phone number, canceling the one Amelia had. The Toyota dealer gave me the low book value for Amelia's car. Fortunately, I had a friend from high school, Logan Lee, who was now a real estate broker. He agreed to sell the house without listing it for a low price with a quick settlement. Just to be safe, I canceled all the credit cards and opened new bank accounts. I cashed in my life insurance policies. It was time to start fresh. I went through the entire house, gathering anything that might have belonged to my wife. There was enough stuff to fill three trash bags. I packed the girls' personal belongings in boxes and took them to a storage unit near the house. I spent three hours sorting through the family photos, putting all the pictures of the girls in a box for them. All the pictures with Amelia went into the trash. It was childish, I know, but I didn't care. The big problem I faced was a lack of direction. I had no idea what I was going to do after the three months were up. Would I stay or move away? Would I keep working or find something new? I had two hobbies, coin collecting, primarily Indian head scents, which were easy to collect and readily available. I bought and sold on eBay and enjoyed it. My second passion was geocaching, but Amelia hated it because of the ticks, poison ivy, and walking required. I didn't see how I could make a living with either of my hobbies. When I wasn't occupied with my hobbies, I spent my time with the Wall Street Journal. Layla and Lily gave me a subscription every year for Christmas. I had no interest in stocks or bonds, but I devoured everything related to farm commodities. I knew more about sugar, wheat, and corn than most market analysts. Of course, it was just a hobby. I had no money invested in any of it. I delved into research on Keystone Development and Nathan Mitchell. Logan Lee managed to gather more information on Nathan and his current project than I could. He was cross-checking some of the information with a friend at one of the local commercial banks. I was eager to see what he came up with. Seven weeks had passed without any sign or word from Amelia. The girls called every week, but they hadn't heard from their mother either. I got the feeling they were on my side, but Amelia was their mother, and I knew they would have to support her to some extent. I had several yard sales and unloaded a ton of stuff. I kept just enough furniture in the house to present it fairly well to any prospective buyers. Amelia and Nathan's photo appeared in the society section of the Sunday newspaper. They were pictured at a political rally, mingling with local influencers and enjoying wine. Several more weeks went by. Logan managed to secure an offer on the house. It was lower than the appraisal, but they wanted to close in 60 days, which worked out perfectly. He had some interesting background on Nathan and wanted to discuss it over lunch. We set a date. Feeling the need to get out of the house, I decided to take a break. Hayes Mountain was one of the best spots in the area for hiking and geocaching. Unfortunately, I had found all the hidden catches there. However, there were three benchmarks on the mountain. Benchmarks are survey reference points placed by the government all over the country, used by surveyors and land developers to establish property lines. They typically consist of metal rods embedded in concrete. Finding benchmarks was an interesting side game for serious geocachers. Today, I decided to locate the three on the mountain. In addition to my GPS, I took my metal detector along. Finding a piece of rebor in the woods was challenging, and I needed all the help I could get. The GPS would guide me to the general area. Most of Hayes Mountain was part of the Madison Land Trust, close to 2,000 acres. However, they were always looking to expand. Subdivisions and industrial parks were consuming most of the available land, 
and the trust relied on donations to survive. There was an orchard and farmhouse beside the trust parking area with a large for sale sign. After parking the car, I found myself wandering over to the fence by the orchard just to take a look. It seemed a shame to think that soon this beautiful property would likely be bulldozed to make way for progress. You going to buy it or just look at it? I couldn't help but smile at the old guy walking toward me. He was dressed in coveralls, but instead of a straw hat, he wore an Andrew Deere baseball cap. He introduced himself as Andrew Wright. Well, if I had a million, I'd be more than happy to take it off your hands. We both chuckled at that. You're not going to have any trouble selling this, are you? I asked. Well, I've got people interested, but I'm trying to hold out as long as I can. Why is that? I was hoping the land trust would buy it, but they can't seem to come up with the money. They want to let the fruit trees go natural, which is fine with me. It beats the hell out of the developers who want to bulldoze it over. I think it would make a fine addition to what's there now. How can the land trust compete with the big boys? I gave them a better deal. The listing is for a million even, but I'll let the trust have it for 600,000. Trumbull is, they can't seem to raise it right now. If they can't do it in 90 days, I'll have to take the option from the damn developer. That son of a bitch calls me every week, and I'm getting tired of it. An option isn't a sale, is it? No, the buyer buys a promise from me to sell him the land in the next six months for the million dollars. He pays a hundred thousand for the option. If he can't raise the million, he forfeits the option payment. It's a good deal for me, I guess, but I just don't want him to have it. He has the million locked up, so he'll be safe. The trouble is he has to get all six properties to make the deal work. That's why he's willing to pay more than the place is worth. What happens if you don't sell him the option? I asked. He'll lose everything, lock, stock, and barrel. Since the land trust can't raise the money, it looks like Keystone has a sure thing. However, if he doesn't get this piece, he'll lose the whole deal, including the money he paid for the options on the other five parcels. That's probably close to a million. His backers will walk away and leave him hanging. If I had the money, I'd help you out. Yeah, that's what they all say. We both shared another laugh, and I left to take my hike. His reference to Keystone intrigued me. The benchmarks were a mile apart, as the crow flies, but on the mountain, it was twice that. The first two were fairly easy to find and were standard surveyor markers. The last one was older and harder to locate. When I finally zeroed in on it, I found a small brick monument with a bronze plate fastened to it, buried under years of leaves and debris. I took a picture to post with the log. That's when my life changed. The metal detector was still on as I walked away from the marker, and it started to beep. Faint, but definitely there. I put the headset on and started scanning the area about 10 feet south of the benchmark. Finally, I zeroed in and carefully probed. You don't normally find metal in the middle of the woods. Five minutes later, I have a small iron box wrapped in a heavily oiled piece of canvas. There was a lot of surface rust, but the box itself was still solid. The lock was heavy bronze but was still doing its job. Quite often, finds like this on public lands are considered treasure and must be turned over to the government or some historical agency. For some reason, that option didn't make sense to me today. I dropped the box into my pack and headed home. During the drive, my mind raced with possibilities of what might be inside. Gold coins, my first thought. Or perhaps important documents from the Civil War or earlier. The possibilities were endless, limited only by the size of the container. Once home, I cleared off the kitchen table, grabbed a Foster's, and examined my find. I hated to destroy the lock, but I couldn't figure out how to open it otherwise. Unsure if the lock's mechanism still worked, I decided it had to go. My bolt cutter made quick work of it. Inside the box, wrapped in another piece of oiled canvas, were twelve pennies. Why would someone go to the trouble of burying twelve pennies? They weren't ordinary, everyday pennies, they were old large cents. The newest was from 1814, the oldest from 1793. Despite their age, each date was easily readable, with no green corrosion common on old copper coins. I never bothered to collect large cents, preferring newer Indian head cents for the value. 
However, I did have a book my grandfather left me, called Penny Whimsy, all about the different types and dye varieties of large scents. It had been gathering dust on my shelf for close to 30 years. Tonight, it would finally come in handy. I stayed up until sunrise with my grandfather's book and a magnifying glass, scanning each coin to create high-definition pictures. Every dye crack and scratch was perfectly displayed, and the condition of each coin was evident. I slept until noon, then called work just to check in. They mentioned that Mason Lewis, one of the company executives, had been asking about me, but they didn't have any more information. With other things on my mind, I didn't pursue it further. I needed to get a safety deposit box from the bank. After spending several hours online, I realized that my pennies were worth several million dollars, not just because of their age, but their condition and dye variety. Now I understood why drug dealers had to go through so much trouble to launder money. There was no easy way to turn my precious coins in hard cash. More work would be required. As I ate breakfast at Idaho P. I noticed another picture in the paper of Amelia and Nathan at the opening of a new art gallery. She was in a black cocktail dress, holding a glass of wine or champagne, and they were both smiling for the camera. Looking at the picture made my next step clearer in my mind. After obtaining the safety deposit box, I called Andrew Wright and asked him to hold off on making any decisions about the land for a few days. He seemed pleased with the phone call. Then I drove to the land trust office and asked for information about making a donation to the organization. They were overjoyed to help me. It would be four weeks until the divorce was final, and for some reason, I felt that this time frame was important. I spent the rest of the day researching coin dealers and auction houses. I wasn't looking for advertisements, but for reputations. Eventually, I zeroed in on Smith and Burns in New York City. They had a strong financial position and seemed capable of handling controversial sales with little problem and low publicity. I made an appointment with them for Monday afternoon. I called the girls and told them to keep Monday morning open so we could have lunch together. The front of the Smith & Burns office was a glitzy showroom with lots of glass and lights. Display cases held a standard variety of collectibles, and the walls were covered with other numismatic supplies. I identified myself and was led to a far less flashy section of the building. Welcome to New York, Mr. Turner. I understand you have a few interesting coppers to show us. Is this your first time in the city? Jacob Smith greeted me as I sat down in a straight-backed chair across the desk from him. His picture was in the ads, but now he looked about 10 years older. Thank you. My daughters are both attending Columbia, so I've been here before, but never on business. I'm not questioning your knowledge of coins, but do you happen to have someone on your staff who specializes in early copper coins? If so, I think their presence would be beneficial. I'm not that sensitive, and I think it would be a good idea also, Jacob said, leaning toward an intercom on the desk. Hannah, have Clark come into my office, please. Daniel Clark had published several reference books on large cents and half cents. I was pleased with his availability. Mr. Clark also appeared older than his pictures. I guess nobody likes to look old. Gentlemen, I have 12 special coins I'm offering for sale. I hope to sell four of them today and leave a fifth one with you for your consideration. The seven other coins I'm holding for later. If everything goes well today, I'll offer them to you also. I know this seems unbelievable, but I think that six of the coins will fall under the condition census status. I'm sure Mr. Clark will determine if I'm close or not. Since condition census cents do not come on the market often, I was hoping you would be interested. Where did these coins come from? Jacob asked skeptically. My grandfather left them to me when he died. I don't want to be insulting, Mr. Turner, but that story is difficult to believe. What do you have to show us? I slid four photos across the desk, each holding an obverse and reverse photo of one of the coins I was offering today. They were about five times normal size and extremely clear. Jacob and Daniel spent several minutes going over each picture. Finally, Jacob spoke. What did you have in mind for these four? A quick check on the most recent auction results led me to believe that about one million three would be in the ballpark, I stated. I was thinking 1.1, but your figure is not out of the question, Daniel replied, showing his expertise in pennies. 
I only want 800,000 for the lot, but it must be handled in a special way, I clarified. Jacob leaned back in his chair and smiled. I think we can handle that. How special are you talking about? I had a form letter from the land trust explaining how to donate land, and I handed it to Mr. Smith along with the real estate listing for Andrew Wright's orchard. I want you to buy this piece of land and donate it to the Madison Land Trust. The price is $600,000. You get a very nice tax deduction and become humanitarians. The rest of the money I'll take in cash. Give us a minute, please, Jacob said, and he and Daniel walked to the other side of the room. After a few minutes, Daniel left and Jacob returned to the table. Do you have the coins with you? Yes. I also have the fifth coin that I would like to leave with you. Mr. Clark returned to the table with a purple crown royal bag. We are willing to meet your terms on the first part of the deal, and we are hoping you can meet ours on the second part, he said, dumping the bag onto the desktop. It consisted of almost a hundred miscellaneous coins, mostly gold, but some silver. The retail price on this collection is close to 300000 For several reasons that we will not discuss, it is difficult for us to sell them. You, however, will have no problem. I understand that you have sold coins on eBay before. Is that correct? I simply nodded. These coins that you also got from your grandfather should sell easily, and we will both come out ahead. I assure you that you will have no difficulty, Jacob added with a slight wink. After a moment's reflection, I agreed to the arrangement. I handed over the four pennies to Mr. Smith, and we all shook hands. Now, Mr. Turner, tell us about this fifth coin, Jacob prompted. I held a photo in my hand and looked at Mr. Clark. What is the highest graded 1793 strawberry you ever saw? I never actually saw one, but I believe the highest graded is a fair 12, he replied. I graded this one as a good 8, but I'm not a professional, I admitted. He wasn't looking at the picture, he was looking at my face as I said that. Both of them were trying to see the photo at the same time. Clark had a big smile on his face, and I could see dollar signs in Tower's eyes. How much? Tower asked eagerly. Best offer if you can figure out how to pay me. Would you like a cup of coffee, Mr. Turner? Sure, black would be fine. They both left the room with the picture, and a few minutes later, a young lady brought me a cup of coffee. Mr. Smith will be with you in a few minutes. He had to make some phone calls. Will you be all right? I nodded yes and started to enjoy my coffee. It was 30 minutes later when Smith came back into the room with an absolutely beautiful lady. She had dark eyes, raven hair, and looked to be Middle Eastern. I guessed that she was no more than 30. She was well-dressed and carried herself with authority. I thought for a second that I recognized her, but couldn't remember from where. Hello, my name is Alina Rutherford. Do you have a passport, Mr. Turner? Her voice was deep but still feminine. Yes. Good. We are leaving for Kennedy shortly so that we can get you a new offshore bank account. Do you have something to give to Mr. Smith? I gave Jacob the 1793 strawberry a rare variety of a large scent, and he looked like a little boy at Christmas. Thank you, thank you, he said as he left the room. We hadn't arrived at a price, but I still had seven coins that Smith wanted. Mr. Smith agreed to hold the small bag of coins until I returned. An hour later, Elena and I were on a plane to the Cayman Islands. She didn't talk much. Several photographers were eager to take her picture when we arrived at the airport. She seemed annoyed with them but still smiled nicely. I had no idea what the interest was. It was my first time flying first class, and it ended way too soon. A bright yellow mini SUV was waiting for us at the terminal. Elena didn't hesitate to jack her skirt up to her thighs as she slid into the driver's seat. To my embarrassment, she caught me sneaking a peek at her tanned legs. She seemed amused at my discomfort. Twenty minutes later, we were parked in the lower level of a medium-sized condominium building. Elena Rutherford owned the entire building but kept the top floor as a private suite. Can I get you anything, Mr. Turner? A beer would be nice. The view of her leaving the room was as good as the flash of light at the terminal. It was not my nature to ogle young women, but Elena Rutherford was special. We walked out to a small balcony overlooking the ocean. 
It was pretty, but the wind was a little too much for my taste. I guess she was trying to impress me with the grandeur of the location. It was beautiful, but I was more interested in the new bank account I was getting. You don't speak much, Mr. Turner. Surely there must be a few questions for which you would like to have answers. I found it odd that a woman of her class and position would be drinking beer out of a bottle. I could picture her sipping champagne or a martini, but not beer. She was not going to have that figure long if she continued. I usually find it better to wait things out, but I guess you could tell me why we needed to come here to open a bank account. It is a simple, safe, and secure place for you to receive money. I think it will work out well for you. It's only one coin. Yes, but you have seven more. I am sorry, but it still seems like a little overkill. To my pleasure, we went back inside, out of the wind. Could you accept this? I brought you here to be my hot slave for a few days. I have to admit, the unexpected comment did bring a smile to my face. I automatically recognized it as bullshit, but still found it humorous. She had a sense of humor, she was good-looking, and she was rich. What more could a man ask for? If only I was ten years younger. It's not nice to tease an old man. We both enjoyed a mild snicker at the situation. Come on, Mr. Turner. Let's go get a few fresh lobsters for supper. We finished our long necks and started out the door. The restaurant and the meal were outstanding. I didn't really enjoy the wine my hostess selected, but tried to be gracious. It didn't work. What's wrong with the wine, Mr. Turner? I was that obvious? I'm sorry. It was an unintentional sort of reflex action. When I was 18, I got drunker than a dog on cheap white wine. I was never more miserable before or since. Every time I smell or taste white wine, I get nauseous. I can't explain it. That's good wine, but don't worry about it. Five minutes later, we had two cold long necks. Oddly enough, there wasn't much conversation during the meal. We each finished up with a fruit sherbet and a coffee. Tell me about yourself. Are you married? Do you have any children? What do you do for a living? We have all night, and I am dying to know what brought us together. That's a lot of questions. I have two daughters. Both of them are at Columbia getting degrees in international banking, or something like that. I don't really know. I just paid the tuition. That's interesting. I have a master's from Columbia, and I am one of their guest lecturers. I must meet both of them. Did you see them this morning? We had lunch together. They hate it when I cause them to miss classes. You must have been married young to have two girls in college. That sounds like the kind of line a guy would use. I felt comfortable with this Mediterranean beauty. I could have talked all night with her. I'm currently separated from my wife. It's a strange feeling, using that word. I never imagined I'd find myself in this situation. She left me for a wealthy businessman, some kind of real estate developer, I think, with fancy cars and a luxurious apartment. She said she was trading up. The divorce will be finalized in about four weeks. That's a shallow reason to end a marriage. I assume everything was going well until she met this guy. I suppose so. She was never really happy with my job choice. I had opportunities to advance, but she didn't want to move. I wasn't thrilled about it, but I thought it was necessary to keep our marriage intact. Now, I feel foolish. What do you do for a living? I hesitated. How do you explain to a beautiful, successful woman that you're a produce manager at a supermarket? She noticed my discomfort and responded. It's not important. We can discuss it later. No, it's fine. I'm not ashamed of my job. It's just that being a supermarket produce manager isn't the kind of job that impresses people, especially my wife. It didn't bother my daughters, but she would conveniently forget to mention it to others. I could tell it bothered her. Do you enjoy what you do? Yes, and I'm good at it. The server brought more coffee and cleared the table. Mr. Turner, I understand that we've only just met, but I believe first impressions count. So, briefly, what's your initial impression of me? Her question put me in a tricky spot. If I was honest, I risked alienating her, but if I tried to flatter her, she'd probably see right through it and peg me as insincere. What to do, what to do? Very briefly, I see you as beautiful, intelligent, well-educated, and confident, 
I replied. She tilted her head slightly and gave me a small grin. I was hoping for some honesty. I'm sorry, but we were having such a pleasant evening that I didn't want to spoil it. Is your true opinion of me really that negative? I didn't want to upset you. Maybe that's why your wife left you for another man. If you hadn't always tried to please her, you might have had a stronger marriage. It was a mean thing to say, but I couldn't deny there was a sliver of truth in it. Miss Rutherford, I believe you're cunning and manipulative. You use your beauty and charm to get what you want. You're used to getting your way, and I sense a bit of a spoiled brat in you. You play with men, but fear commitment. You seem to know how to handle money, both earning and spending it wisely. If you weren't so fixated on proving yourself equal to any man, you'd probably make a good mother. I felt guilty after saying that, but her comment about my marriage got under my skin. We just sat there, staring at each other for a few moments. Do you really think I'd make a good mother? Suddenly, the mood lightened considerably. Everything felt pleasant again during the short ride back to the condo. I knew she had heard everything I said, but she seemed to accept it without argument. She wanted the truth, so I gave it to her. The fact that she didn't get upset made me feel better about being honest with her. My night as Alina Rutherford's companion ended up being somewhat uneventful. It's hard to feel passionate in unfamiliar bedrooms, but that was fine by me. I hadn't expected much anyway. The next morning, I was the first one awake. I found a spread of fruit, Danish pastries, and steaming coffee waiting, along with a copy of the Wall Street Journal. The wind had calmed, so I indulged in breakfast on the balcony with a view of the Caribbean. It was a scene I could definitely get used to. About 20 minutes later, Alana joined me, playfully grabbing a portion of the paper. We sat in comfortable silence, reading and sipping coffee as if we'd been doing it for years. Despite only knowing her for a day, everything about Alana felt natural and easy. I'm worried my phone won't work here, and I really should call my daughters, Elena said. I was handed her cell phone. Go ahead. It's on me. Layla, it's me, I said when her daughter picked up. Where are you? Is everything okay? Your phone says London. I'm in the Caymans and everything's fine. Just staying with a friend. Had to use her phone. Your picture was on TV last night. They showed you boarding a plane with Elena Rutherford. What on earth are you doing with her? She's the friend I'm staying with. What's the big deal? Why are you with her? It's nothing to worry about. There's nothing shady going on. I don't get why you're so concerned. Dad, that woman is ruthless. She eats men for breakfast. Elena was coming back in with the breakfast trade from the balcony. As she passed by, I couldn't resist. It's Layla, my daughter in New York. She thinks I should watch out because you're ruthless. Certainly. Layla overheard me talking to Elena and let out a loud moan through the phone. I could hear Layla and Lily chatting hurriedly on the other end. Why are you there? How do you know her? When are you coming home? Before I could address any of her inquiries, Elena stood beside me, hand extended, waiting for the phone. Hi Layla, this is Elena. Your father has shared a lot about you and your sister. I'll be in New York tomorrow and would love to have lunch with both of you. Where should I pick you up? I had no clue about Layla's responses. Who is the professor? Pause. No problem, I'll pick you up from the classroom at 11. Okay, I'll say goodbye for you. Bye now. Elena handed the phone back to me. Your daughter said goodbye. I'll be lunching with them tomorrow. I'll be on my best behavior, even though they see me as a fish. With a giggle and a sway of her hips, she headed to her room. An hour later, we were at the Cayman Federal Reserve Bank. Under Elena's guidance, I set up my first offshore bank account, and within 20 minutes, I saw $1.4 million wired to my new account from Smith & Burns. I thought it was a fair price for a 215-year-old penny. That afternoon, she arranged for a friend to take us out to feed manta rays. At dinner, I asked her why she was involved with a company like Smith & Burns, only to find out she owned 60% of it. What else can you tell me about yourself? You seem to be a major player in the global financial scene, and I'm embarrassed to admit I know very little about you. I hail from London, born and bred. My father is Israeli, and my mother is Turkish. 
I hold an MBA from Columbia. As for my personal life, I'm not married, but I've been engaged twice. It's been over three years since I had a serious relationship. I've learned to be wary of men who show interest in me. I guess you could call me cynical, but I feel most of them are after something from me, offering nothing in return. That's unfortunate. I was hoping for a lift back to the condo. Does that mean you don't trust me? You're supposed to take this seriously, you big jerk. I apologize if I seem insensitive. That wasn't my intention. I'm just finding it hard to connect with your situation. I'll try to be more understanding. All right, let's lighten up. We have a party to attend. The evening concluded at a cocktail party in one of the city's larger hotels. Everyone treated her like a celebrity, as they all knew her. I spent the night trying to remain inconspicuous, still wearing the street clothes from New York, unprepared for this tropical detour. Elena initially felt obligated to accompany me, but I convinced her to let me blend into the background, where I felt more comfortable. She tried to let loose but kept checking up on me throughout the night. Somehow, I found myself engaged in conversation with a couple of Latin gentlemen, cattle ranchers from Argentina. We began with soccer and transitioned to fishing, all in English, presumably for my benefit. One of them even complimented Elena's appearance, unaware that I was her date for the evening. It was a bit flattering. My part in the conversation mostly consisted of smiles and nods. I didn't have much to add until Alberto Castro brought up investments. He showed a keen interest in winter wheat. As he explained, I found myself listening intently to his detailed plan to invest a substantial amount of money into a venture he seemed unfamiliar with. His apparent wealth left me puzzled about how he had acquired it. Usually, I prided myself on maintaining a poker face, but this time, my fixade seemed to falter. Mr. Turner, your expression tells me you're not on board with the winter wheat investment, he said, catching my reaction. I had been caught off guard. I had intended to observe quietly, but my invisibility cloak had failed me. I'm sorry, Alberto. I'm not an investor, and I don't grasp the complexities of it all, I confessed, using his first name to ease the formality. Perhaps by sense you have an opinion, he replied. I'll keep poking until you share it with us. I was cornered, attempting a slight smile. I deflected, I think I need a refill. For the next hour, the two of us listened carefully as the greengrocer from Alabama expounded on how the robust winter wheat crop in Alberta and Saskatchewan would compensate for the poor crop in the states. The Canadian Grain Board had leased all available grain silos in North and South Dakota to store the surplus, even reserving railway grain cars for temporary storage. Winter wheat futures would begin to decline within the week and continue until the market stabilized. Both Canada and the U.S. would be compelled to export wheat overseas. I was running out of witty remarks when Elena approached us. Alberto and his friends seemed pleased that she joined our little circle, and they were genuinely surprised when she took my arm and led me away. What was that all about, Ryan? Elena asked as we walked. We were just chatting about groceries, you know, I replied with a grin. She smiled back as we headed back to the condo. The next morning, we flew back to New York, where a group of photographers eagerly awaited her arrival. A courier from Smith & Burns handed me a small package containing the coins I had left behind. Elena and I exchanged goodbyes, and I made my way to the commuter terminal for the flight back to Huntsville. The divorce proceedings were still on track, as was the sale of the house. Mason Lewis, from the head office, had left several messages for me to call him. They were asking me again to consider relocating to the corporate headquarters in New York. This time, I accepted. Andrew Wright had also left a message, wanting to meet for lunch. I cleaned out my locker at work and wished my replacements good luck. The newspaper had a picture of Nathan and Amelia attending a bar B hue for one of the local politicians. They looked like the perfect couple. It took a full day to scan and identify all the coins in the bag from New York. Since I had three weeks before I had to leave, I decided to list them on eBay as soon as possible. Everything should go smoothly as long as I didn't encounter any deadbeats. Posting the listings and preparing all the envelopes and shipping labels took another full day. All the money would go to my PayPal account, and from there to my new offshore bank. Now, I have the weekend to relax.
My Friday lunch with Andrew Wright proved to be quite interesting. Andrew was thrilled that I had stood up to Nathan, but he expressed disappointment that I hadn't gained anything from the situation. It would have been too convoluted to explain to him. Nevertheless, lunch went well, and as he departed, he handed me the deed to five acres of land on the outskirts of town. He and his wife were moving to Florida and wanted to clear out before leaving. It's true what they say, no good deed goes unrewarded. Shortly after parting ways with Andrew, my cell phone rang. Layla and Lily were due to arrive in Nashville in two hours. I had just enough time to drive up there to pick them up. Flights to Nashville were much cheaper than to Huntsville, and the girls were on a tight budget. Getting there and picking them up was no trouble at all. Layla couldn't wait to tell me about Alina. In the middle of a lecture with over 300 students for advanced corporate finance, the professor stopped to introduce Alina. She just walked in like she owned the place. She spoke to the class for about 10 minutes and then announced that she needed two students for a power lunch at the Weston Hotel. We couldn't believe it when she called out our names. Did you like her? She's amazing, Dad. How did you even meet her? Well, she mentioned she was looking for a hot assistant, and I was her first choice. Lily lightly hit my shoulder. That's not funny. Be serious, will you? What did you guys talk about at lunch? She asked about our classes and school stuff. Lily giggled a bit. She had a lot of questions about you. Layla and I both think she might be interested in more than just a friendly relationship. I'm over 10 years older than her and not exactly rolling in cash. Sorry girls, but she's way out of my league. Dad, she can have any guy she wants. Why you? Think about it and give us a clue. To us, you're perfect, but Elena Rutherford doesn't know you like we do. Well, apparently, your mother didn't either. Things quieted down for a few minutes after my ill-advised comment about their mother. It landed like a turd in a punch bowl, unintentionally souring the mood. I immediately regretted my words. I'm sorry, girls. That came out wrong. Your mother is a wonderful woman, and I shouldn't have spoken like that. Don't worry about it, Dad. We get it, one of them replied. Silence settled in for a few miles until Lily's phone began buzzing as soon as we crossed into Alabama. Hello. Pause. Yeah, we arrived about an hour ago. Everything's fine. Pause. You're kidding? Pause. That sounds great. I'll let him know. Thanks for calling. Bye. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I saw Lily giving Layla a thumbs up. What was that about? Lily leaned forward from the back seat. Guess what, Dad? Elena's coming to Huntsville on Tuesday morning. She says you owe her a night's accommodation, and she expects breakfast in bed. It was flattering news, but I felt a subtle pressure from Elena, and now from my daughters. While it all sounded fine, I wondered if I was up to the task in more ways than one. The weekend with the girls went smoothly. They spent Saturday afternoon with their mother, but didn't meet Nathan. I asked them not to mention Elena. We sorted through the belongings they wanted to keep from the house, and by the time they left, everything was sorted out. I prepaid the storage unit until they finished school. On the drive back to Nashville, they made me promise to try to get along with Alina. When I asked what they meant, Layla said, just don't upset her. It seemed simple enough. They were excited about my transfer to the city. I still hadn't figured out what Alina saw in an old man who didn't even own in our mini suit. When I arrived home, it was time to unwind with a beer and the Sunday paper. There were no snapshots of Amelia and Nathan this week, but I did notice a brief mention that the Keystone Development Company was facing hurdles in securing financing for a local project. Winter wheat futures had plummeted to a record low. That caught my attention. I phoned Logan Lee and invited him over. It wasn't lunch, but I figured we could chat over a couple of beers. Nathan Mitchell had quite a colorful history. For years, he'd been either broke or living the high life. He was constantly on the move, trying to dodge creditors and friends who'd lent him money. Now his latest project was hitting rough waters. Backers and investors were vanishing. I'd never tasted beer so good. Monday morning turned out better than I expected. The coins I had up for auction were fetching much higher bids than I had anticipated. Clark had estimated their value at around $300,000. They might not reach that mark, 
but they were well on their way to surpassing 200,000. In just over two weeks, I'd be a free man. Three months ago, that would have seemed like a disaster, but today, I was eagerly looking forward to it. The buyers for the house had arranged financing and were ready to close. It struck me as ironic that Amelia felt so secure with Nathan that she didn't need any of our shared assets. I wondered if she realized how uncertain her future was. I had a meeting with the new owners of the house at 3 o'clock. They promptly transferred the $200,000 to my offshore account. Luckily, they were fine with me staying in the house for another week. It was a win-win situation. The next morning, I received a call before I even had my coffee. An unknown caller informed me formally that Ms. Rutherford would be arriving at 10.45 a.m. on Delta Flight 724. I arrived 30 minutes early, feeling a bit anxious. Somehow, a couple of paparazzi got wind of her arrival and were waiting outside the terminal. I did my best to blend in. I parked in the short-term lot, not expecting the attention. Instead of waiting for me to pick her up, Elena decided to walk with me to get the car. The photographers managed to snap my license plate, and the secret was out. I wasn't accustomed to this hullabaloo, but Elena seemed unfazed. She even apologized for it on the way to the house. As she stepped off the plane, I couldn't help but want to kiss her. Silly me. I felt embarrassed by how bare the house was. Over the past few months, I had gotten rid of as much as possible. What remained were just the basics, which the new owner agreed to take care of once I left. Elena seemed amused by my attempts to apologize. With nothing to eat at home, we made a quick trip to the local Taco Bell, her choice. I promised her dreamland ribs for dinner. It was refreshing to be with a woman who had a healthy appetite. Elena, I'm glad you're here, but I don't understand why. I thought you'd be back to business. This is business, silly. I heard you're moving to New York next week. You'll need a place to stay, and I have a spare bedroom. I'm here to help you pack. A truck will come tomorrow morning to move anything you can't fit in your car. No furniture, please. How did you find out I was moving? That's what I do. If I keep track of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. Okay, that's total bullshit, but I've always wanted to say it. Aren't you scheming with my daughters? I attempted to flash her an innocent grin, though at my age, appearing coy was a challenge. Her proposal caught me off guard, yet I couldn't find a reason to decline. Absolutely. Now, let's grab a few boxes and start packing. I sensed she might be more at ease in a boardroom or a bank, but she seemed to relish being with me. Still, the age gap left me slightly uneasy. We ended up discarding more items than we packed. She had strong opinions about my wardrobe and turned a deaf ear to my pleas for leniency. She promised to take me shopping for proper attire once I was settled in New York. By the time we finished, there were more boxes than I could fit in my car, but not quite enough for a moving van. I hoped she had ordered a small truck. I set aside my laptop and small inkjet printer to handle the eBay auction items. We were about to head out for dinner when another surprise arrived. An auto delivery van parked in front of the house. Elena and I watched as the driver, dressed in a sharp uniform, stepped out with a clipboard. Are you Ryan Turner? Yes. I have a delivery for you. Where would you like it? What on earth is it? A car. It's from a Mr. Alberto Castro. Is there room in the garage? The space that once held Amelia's Toyota sat empty. I gestured in that direction and nodded. I noticed Elena stifling a laugh behind her hand. I suspected she found amusement in my bewilderment. Five minutes later, I found myself staring at a gleaming orange sports car parked next to my old Toyota. What on earth is this? With a proud grin, the delivery guy replied, That's a 2008 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider Super Leggera model. Isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Alina struggled to contain her laughter not being loud but clearly enjoying herself. I signed the delivery form, allowing the dapper delivery man to head home. I had no clue what to do with this unexpected gift, but one thing was for sure, I wasn't driving it to New York. Get in the Toyota, Miss Funny Pants. My companion still had a smile on her face as we backed out of the driveway. 
I ordered a full rack of ribs and two fosters. Care to enlighten me about the car? Alberto made a bold move with winter wheat futures. Everyone thought he was crazy. But when the price plummeted, he doubled down on his contracts. In less than a week, he made over $40 million. He was thrilled about the money, but even more so about the praise for his savvy move. Well, good for Alberto. I just hope he didn't mention my involvement. He wanted to give you credit, but only with your consent. He thanked me for bringing you to the party and asked for your address. I didn't know he'd take it this far, though. The ribs arrived, and I watched Alina liberally douse them with Tabasco before digging in. God, I adored this girl. You know I'm sending it back in the morning, right? I figured as much. Don't worry about it. Alberto won't be offended. He would have gladly offered you money, but he probably guessed you'd refuse. This way, you'll feel a little more obligated to keep the cash. Thanks to the Tabasco, we found ourselves ordering a few more beers. I was thoroughly enjoying myself, with no desire to head home. At that moment, I would have given anything to spend the night in bed with this beautiful young woman. I invite those smooth, charming lover boys who could charm any girl into bed within minutes. The best I could hope for was a good night kiss, but we couldn't linger all night, so eventually, I had to drag home. The next morning was simply wonderful. All my anxieties had been for nothing. As soon as we walked in the door, Elena took my hand and led me to the bedroom. Being a true gentleman, I did everything I could think of to ensure her needs were met first, and I was rewarded with a fantastic night, something rare in my sheltered life. Breakfast in bed was a simple affair of juice, coffee, and Danish. I'm sorry, but this is the best I can do under the circumstances. It's more than I could have hoped for. Eating off a tray in bed is more awkward than it sounds. After a few giggles and some rearranging, we retreated to the kitchen. Breakfast in bed sounds tidier than it actually is. Elena, sorry to break the mood, but I'm really curious as to why you chose me. I don't have much to offer, and you deserve so much more. I've been burned too many times by smooth-talking lover boys. I won't fall into that trap again. Oh, I get it. You're attracted to me because I'm not smooth or charming. My guest found this amusing and gave a slight laugh. Ryan, I was impressed with the deal you made back in New York with Jacob. I was just selling some coins. Not just that. I found the deal you proposed to buy the trust fund land intriguing. So, you see me as a philanthropist. Oh, not at all. I see you as a clever guy who took advantage of a unique situation to get back at your wife's lover. That brought a smile to my face. I was amazed at how clever she was and how well she hid it. Was that wrong? No, Ryan, it was brilliant. I was impressed and wanted to know more about you after that. You couldn't possibly have known what I was doing in New York. I knew what you did, but I didn't find out why until a few days later. You were checking up on me. Of course, I'm not naive. I had to admit, the ego boost was refreshing. Unfortunately, Elena had an early morning flight back to New York. I hated to see her go. She left me feeling content and with a key to her apartment. The Lamborghini dealer couldn't make it to pick up the car until the next day, which was fine by me since I had no plans of driving it anyway. The movers arrived in a small truck to collect my belongings bound for New York. Then Logan Lee called, informing me of Keystone Development's dire financial straits. It appeared Nathan had suddenly lost almost all his backers overnight. Rumors swirled about people calling in markers Nathan couldn't cover. That evening, my soon-to-be ex-wife paid an unexpected visit. What brings you here? I couldn't resist a touch of sarcasm. I need to talk to you about a few things. I'm leaving in a few days, but I'll help however I can. I wanted to borrow my old Toyota, but it's gone. What's with the orange car in the garage? Things were getting interesting. I'm sorry, Amelia. When you said you didn't want your old Toyota, I sold it back to the dealer. You can check if they still have it. Damn. I'd never heard Amelia swear before. The orange car was a gift, but I'm returning it tomorrow. I can't see myself driving something like that. The sticker said $225,000. Who would give you a gift like that? 
your new girlfriend. No, it was a cattle rancher from Argentina I helped out a few weeks back. It was just a token of appreciation. So, what else can I help you with? There was a pause. I could tell Amelia had more to say, but was unsure how to broach the topic. Would you like a drink? I have beer and some diet soda. No, I can't stay long. How did you get here anyway? I don't see a car. I took a cab. Ryan, you said you're leaving in a few days. Would it be all right if I stayed in the house for a while? The house is sold. We had the closing yesterday, and the new owners will be moving their things in this weekend. They're letting me stay until Friday, but that's it. What's wrong with the condo by the river? She didn't answer that question. There was a short lull, and then she asked, What happened to the money you got for the house? Things were really getting interesting now. I was beginning to enjoy the direction this conversation was taking. It's gone. You made it clear you didn't want any of it. Whatever money there was, I used to set up a new apartment for when I move. Where are you moving to? New York. I got a promotion and a big increase in salary. I have to be there on Monday. I had no intention of telling Amelia that I was going to be living with Alina. I also had no intention of telling her about the bank account in the Caymans. You never told me what happened to the condo. It was only leased. The lease ran out, and the owner did not want to renew it. Where are you living now? We are staying at the Holiday Inn until Nathan can get a new place lined up. Oh, I see. Now I understood why she wanted to move into our old house. Amelia seemed a little bewildered. She wanted to ask for help, but didn't know how to approach it. I could tell she was in trouble. There was another lull in the conversation. Is there anything else I can do for you? Can you give me a lift back to the Holiday Inn? The first half of the ride was quiet. I understand you have a girlfriend. Tell me about her. She's not really a girlfriend, but more like a business associate. What kind of business? You aren't in any kind of business. You're right. I'm just a produce clerk in a grocery store. I can't fool you, can I? Amelia was quiet. She looked out the window, and I heard her whisper to herself, Bastard. At that moment, I had the perfect chance to vent all my frustrations. It was a golden opportunity to express how much those newspaper photos had stung. But instead, I just smiled to myself. She was clearly struggling, and I felt vindicated. There was a twinge of guilt, but it passed quickly. I dropped her off at the motel entrance. She walked away without a backward glance or a goodbye. I hated to admit it, but I felt a small sense of satisfaction. It was shaping up to be a good week. Thursday morning, I unexpectedly received my final divorce papers. They were early, but who was I to complain? On the front page of the Huntsville paper, there was a photo of Elena Rutherford arriving at the airport, with yours truly holding her arm. Each room at the Holiday Inn got a free copy of the paper, so Amelia could read it with her breakfast. I was certain Nathan would explain who Elena was to her. I emptied out the safety deposit box at the bank. My seven pennies would come in handy soon. I thought Elena might ask about them while she was here, but she never did. Our conversations were strictly social. If she had any business interests in me, she didn't show it. I had buy it now prices on all the coins I had up for auction. Over half of them sold at that price. I spent the rest of the day packaging the coins that closed and getting them ready for the post office. The rest of the auctions would be closing before noon on Friday. If all the PayPal payments went through, they'd all be in the mail that afternoon. Any stragglers would have to wait until Monday. On Saturday morning, I hit the road early. Most of the funds from my PayPal account had been transferred to my Cayman account, keeping a small amount just in case. As I was leaving, the new owners of the house were pulling up, a convenient timing for both parties. The journey up north would take about 12 hours without any delays. Elena was waiting at the apartment and promised a home-cooked meal upon my arrival. I wondered who would be the one cooking it. It was reassuring to know I still had enough charm to capture the heart of such a beauty. I had no doubt I could meet any of her expectations. As I crossed into Virginia on Interstate 81, Layla called. Nathan Mitchell had apparently skipped town, leaving Amelia stranded with no car, no place to live, and a hefty motel bill. 
I asked Layla for advice. She chuckled and simply said, just smile. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.